Hello, I'm Herb Munster and the director of the IPMM, Intellectual Property Management and Markets Program here at the Illinois Institute of Technology. We're having this Google Hangout this evening to discuss IPMM Global, IIT's online master degree program in IP management and markets. As we go through our presentation, you can submit any questions you have and we'll try to get to them at the end if we have time. So let's, let's start with the presentation and see where we are. As I said, my name is Herb Munsterman. Here's a little bit of my background and it explains a little bit of the diversity in, in the profession of IP management. You can see that I was a patent lawyer. You can see that I worked in a large law firm. I happen to also have a background in uh, biochemistry. It's important to note only for this reason that it took me a long career to become an IP management professional, to have the combination of legal business and technical knowledge that people look to in order to advise them on IP management. It took a long time and most professionals in the area have been at it for a long time. There's a vice president at IPM who has hired people from the program and she's interested in the program for this reason. That because a lot of the professionals in the program are in, in IP management have been at it for a number of years, they tend to retire. There simply aren't people to fill in the career path. And that's where the masters in IPMM from IIT comes in to prepare people to have a career in IP management. IPMM Global at IIT is a master's degree, requires 30 credits. The knowledge from these classes is taken from law, finance, IP valuation, innovation, and strategy. Our faculty comes from all over the university and throughout the industry. There's a, a the people come from Ocean Tomo. We have speakers from Red Chalk, which is a big valuation firm. KPMG, Charles River. These are important names in the IP field that you're going to know. The student body itself is diverse. It comes from around the world. The program in particular, IPMM Global, is an online semester-based program. With that, you should know that the, you can begin the program in the summer, the fall, or the spring, but it's a semester-based program. It progresses in 12 weeks. You'll have, uh, you'll have obligations with regard to the class. You'll have discussions in the class, exams, perhaps projects, perhaps group projects with others from around the world. The courses that are online have been developed with the same faculty who are teaching here in Chicago at the Illinois Institute of Technology. As the program is just beginning up, just starting up, IPMM Global is just starting up, there's an ability here for, for potential students to get a scholarship, and it's noted at the bottom of this slide. If you're having questions about the scholarship and how to get it, make sure there'll be some information at the end of the presentation on how to contact us for further information. And that'll give you also uh, a better view as to what the program is. Now, when we talk a little bit about why IP is deserving of a master's program on the whole, it's because IP is the booming business of the 21st century. Why is that? Well, let's look at nearly any press outlet. There's hundreds of articles about IP every month. There are blog articles. There are thousands of books. The Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, they address a lot of the business of IP. And this is important because what we want to look at is how do you become a manager of intellectual property? We live in a knowledge-based economy. We look at this slide and we can see that of these major companies, red being the intangible value, and blue being the tangible value, that the intangible value in each of these companies is significantly larger than the tangible value 
But what does that mean? Tangible value is stuff. It's things like buildings. It's things like factories. It's things like inventory. All of those things, it's important to know, have to be maintained and have to be protected. We have to have equipment replaced. We have to change the oil in cars. Historically, however, IP has not been looked at in the same way. IP was for years something for lawyers, sort of a necessary evil. We dealt with what we had to go to court. But there was a realization 15 years ago, 20 years ago, of how much value is in these intangibles. That the single biggest asset, this intangible asset, forms so much more of the value of these companies. It was about time to take a business perspective and how to deal with it, to treat it like a real asset. In order to do that, you'd have to learn how to maintain it, how to protect it, how to eliminate the parts that aren't productive, how to increase and expand the parts of the IP that are very valuable and productive in your business. Here's another slide that just sort of outlines the same thing about tangibles versus intangibles and what part of a market capitalization, the value of a given company on the stock market, what percent of it is valued in intangible value. A very interesting one there is Coca-Cola. We This trademark of Coca-Cola is ubiquitous. It's available everywhere, right? You can't have a sporting event without seeing Coca-Cola. You can barely turn on the television without seeing a street scene that doesn't have Coca-Cola advertised in it. 95% of the value of all the stock in Coca-Cola that exists in the world is based on an intangible property. That is intellectual property. Those are the assets that we're trying to manage. Those are the assets that we care about. So ultimately, what is IP management? IP management is working with your portfolio of assets, the patents, the trademarks, the copyrights, the trade names, and making sure that they match up to what the business plan is. If you're a maker of cellular phones, obtaining a lot of patents in making tractors is probably not a good way to spend your time. Now that's pretty obvious, but there are things that are a little bit closer to home. Every business plans its future, five-year plans, 10-year plans, business plans. They talk about where the business is going to go, since so much of the value of any given company comes from intellectual property, comes from intangibles, the intangibles, the intellectual property, have to follow that plan in order for the business to realize its goals. One thing that impacts those goals is to know that IP assets have a life. They end. Just like a building will crumble, a car will stop running, IP assets stop functioning after a while if they aren't maintained. Patents you might know have a term. Copyrights and trademarks do as well. Trade secrets can be kept forever. The classic example is the formula for Coca-Cola. If you don't tell anyone what it is, it remains a trade secret forever. If you give it up, it's gone immediately. So we're interested in managing IP to understand how do we keep confidential information like this formula of Coca-Cola private? How do we maintain our patents? Everyone knows about patents. How do we keep the lives of these things going forward? Good IP management is the process of doing this to the greatest overall benefit of the organization. We don't want to spend money on IP assets that don't realize our business. We want to allocate funds to doing research that'll move us along. We want to pay our lawyers to get the patents that we need to ensure that we have freedom to do our business. We want to know that the books that we publish are ours and are not being taken by others. We want to maximize our management of this IP to maximize the potential of our businesses. 
This is the sort of knowledge that we want to pass to you in the IPMM Global Program. How do you do that? Well, obviously, to understand the IP needs of a business, you have to understand the business. It doesn't sound like a very sophisticated question, but it's interesting to note that not a lot of people know how businesses actually make money. They don't understand the costs that go into each product. They don't understand the work that goes into each product, the research that goes into each product, the marketing cost that goes into each product, the raw material costs. All of those things are what give us the opportunity to make a profit. And what is the profit? I have a friend who's an accountant who's, who will tell me that if there is any profit at all, it's due to intellectual property. It's because you sell better, that's intellectual property. Because you have better technology, that's intellectual property. That you have a better customer list, that's intellectual property. Your distribution network, your chain of stores that you work with, the secrets that you have about how to discuss your, discuss your products, sell your products, that's all intellectual property. That justifies the profit that you're able to make. Company A and Company B sell TVs. They sell the exact same product. They look the same. I can't tell the difference. But maybe instead of Company X, I want to own a TV that's made by Company Y. Why? Because I like their mark. I like their name. I believe that there's a lot of intangible aspects of that name. There's value in it. Those are the assets that we're trying to manage here. The value in those names, the value in the patents, the value in the inventions. That's the next step. Define the IP value model and the policy. How are we gonna treat these inventions? Are we gonna patent them? Are we gonna publish them? Make the world know them? Are we gonna keep them silent? Like the formula for Coca-Cola. Or are we going to use some other method to protect them? And when we do that, how are we going to judge their value? A patent in and of itself has no value. It's a piece of paper. It describes a piece of property that maybe you use, maybe you don't. It's very difficult to value a patent. And that absorbs a lot of the time in our program, is discussing how intellectual property can be ascribed value. It's difficult. It's an art. It's a science. It's something we discuss in great detail because it's a piece of knowledge that you need in order to properly manage intellectual property. As IP rights are generated, we can make decisions again about should we file on them? Should we even do research in-house? Or maybe it's a better idea to acquire a competitor to buy a new technology from someone else to add to ours. In order to do that, of course, you have to know what your competitors are doing. You have to know if they can function in the area that you're competing. Are their TVs doing the same thing that my TVs are doing? Does the picture look the same? Does the technology look the same? Do they have an IP right that can keep me out of duplicating what they're doing? Or can I get that somewhere else? That necessity of following what your competitor is doing is called benchmarking. IP rights and the vast amount of data that are involved in IP generally is very useful in understanding what your competitors are doing. We can search databases, understand technologies that our competitors are working on. We can understand technologies because of what they filed for things that they may wish to work on in the future. And that will inform some of our business decisions. We can bring that back and have that affect our business plans. We need to understand our own portfolio. We need to understand its strengths, its weaknesses, the opportunities that it presents, and the threats there are to it. A pretty classic example are pharmaceuticals and drugs. We can often watch the prices of drug companies increase and decrease along with their patent portfolio. As 
patents come to maturity for a given drug, and if there's nothing in the pipeline to follow it up, you'll hear every financial commentator speak about, well, they have nothing in the pipeline. They're speaking about intellectual property rights. They're speaking about research. They're speaking about the drugs that will replace the ones that are about to come off patent. The price of the stock can plummet. You can historically see it by watching any number of pharmaceutical companies, whether it's Merck or Johnson & Johnson or uh, any other pharmaceutical company. As a blockbuster drug comes off patent, the value of the stock generally decreases. As a new drug is acquired or developed and the IP rights are perfected around it, the stock can increase. It's not just pharmaceuticals. We see that in electronics. We see that in chemistry. We see that in all of business because all of business touch is touched by intellectual property rights. So we have this giant asset. Going back to that early slide, we saw how much value is in intangible assets. Not all of it is necessarily useful. That's one reason why we track and we want our IP portfolio to track our business plan. We want to build up the areas that we're emphasizing, and we want to get rid of the assets that aren't productive. And that's the last bit of this slide, to build and prune the portfolio, to customize it to shape the business that you want to be in, and not spend money on IP that's useful to a business that you are not in. You can get rid of it. You can sell it. You could let it expire. You could do a variety of things, and that's part of IP planning. All of this taken together is how we're going to manage an IP portfolio. What if we don't? I said earlier that for a long time, IP assets were looked at as some sort of creature of the law, that people didn't worry about them a whole lot. Failing to protect those assets is like failing to keep your a new roof on your building. If the roof caves in, a big expense will follow. If you've not kept up your patent portfolio, a big expense may follow. It might be a litigation. It might be the inability to do a business. It might be a flood of new competitors into a business that you had to yourself before because your IP portfolio was strong. Litigation, we can read about nearly every day in the paper. Company A has threatened company B with an infringement suit. If your portfolio is managed well, the threat of IP infringement suits is lessened. It can't be eliminated no matter what you do, but it can be lowered. The strength of your portfolio can help you defend yourself against claims from others can put you in a position where even if they claim against you, you can assert something back. You can claim that they were bad guys against you. All of this helps in the negotiating of settlements. If you don't know what your portfolio has in it, you miss the opportunity to take advantage of these aspects of having an IP portfolio. Another area, which is seemingly odd, but quite often a large company can duplicate its own effort it tends to reinvent the wheel over and over again because it forgot that a few years ago it worked on the project that had a similar aspect to it. If your portfolio is managed well, if you understand what you've done in the past, where you put your money in the past and with, with regard to research, with regard to IP rights, you can advise yourself of where you can go in the future and keep this knowledge in-house and leverage it for the future. There's many stories that are out in the press of inventions from long ago that found new life. AZT, one of the original drugs used to combat AIDS, was originally discovered as a cure for baldness. It sat on the shelf for a number of years and a chemist looked at it and said, this might have some use as an antiviral compound. And they were right. And a new value was discovered 
in AZT. Because they were aware that the compound existed, that this work had been done before, they were able to leverage that work and develop a new and highly profitable business to be in. So what we're looking at if we fail to manage our IP is, that, is a potential loss of these benefits, of revenue, of reputation. We've been sued. We've been said that we're treading on someone else's rights. Industry development. You can't be a leader if you are only a follower. IP managed properly allows you to be a leader. If you don't commercialize these rights, if you do research and don't bring those rights into a money-making place, if you just get that patent, that piece of paper, and it sits in a desk, you're missing these opportunities. What does that do? It lowers the profile of your company. People who are working at companies that are on the decline are not happy. Morale is low, innovation becomes low. IP management supports all of these activities supports a company being the best company that it can be. As I noted earlier, we're intending to give you the knowledge that you need to have a career in IP management. That 30 years that I spent getting the knowledge that I have distilled down into a number of courses that are intense, informative, and useful as you try to enter the world of IP management. This knowledge is hard to come by. It's very distributed. And we brought it here. We brought top professors and top knowledge in order to concentrate this knowledge in a way that you can make it accessible to you so you can take it with you into your career. On this slide are listed the classes that were that you need to take in order to uh, receive the master's degree. We have our introduction and in protecting IP class, which is what we call a boot camp. It's an orientation toward the world of IP, a little bit of patents, a little bit of law, a little bit of valuation, a little bit of business. Some work spent on understanding innovation and creativity, because after all, innovation and creativity are the seeds from which IP grows. As we move through the other classes, like managing the creative process, IP assessment and searching, acquiring IP, the perspective that you earn in the boot camp is expanded with a deeper understanding, again, of things like the creative process. That it's interesting that creativity can be managed with the right tools. And this class is set up to give you those tools. IP assessment and searching is part of understanding, is the IP that you have appropriate to your needs? Is it strong or is it frail? It's an interesting concept. One would generally think that a patent is a patent is a patent. But because of the nature of them, they're a claim of a property right, a description, a sort of word painting, of what the invention is, it can be done strongly and importantly, and it can be done weakly, such that the patent itself doesn't really provide any particular increase in value to what was known before. Acquiring IP is very important. It's one of the main aspects, main pathways to ex rapidly expanding an IP portfolio. So it's central to uh, becoming a master of IP management. Later on in the progression of classes are classes in strategy, global management, and maximizing IP value. IP is a worldwide business. There are patent rights in China. There are patent rights in the United States, patent rights in South America, patent rights in Europe. They interact with each other differently they are given or granted to owners in differing ways. There are a variety of attempts in the world, attempts in the world to unify what these rights are. There are a number of areas where they're treated distinctly differently. 
There are countries where trade secrets are recognized and protected. And there are countries where trade secrets don't exist at all. In order to understand IP, in order to understand the world business of IP, knowledge of these areas is important. And we spend a significant amount of time of the advanced classes in looking at the world and how the world deals with IP. Ultimately, we're interested in maximizing the value of that portfolio. Is it the right portfolio? Are those patent claims strong? Are those trademarks good? The last class is called our capstone class. In the capstone class, the accumulated knowledge from all the classes that you've taken before is utilized to study a company and to do an assessment of the entire company and its IP position. It's a tough experience. It's a concentrated experience and it's a difficult piece of work. But that's what you do as an IP professional. It's important to note it that there are a couple of electives available and those electives can be in a variety of things. They can be strategic, strategic in ways or they can fill gaps that you might have. If you need particular knowledge in licensing or particular knowledge in the big data aspects of IP, those credits, elective credits will be available to you. All of this is for a purpose, of course. And the purpose is to deliver the graduates with the education and skills that they need to be recognized as IP professionals. There are a variety of certificates that can be done. There are a variety of uh, short courses that can be done. But at IIT, we offer a master's degree from a world recognized university in the area of IP management. It's one of the few programs in the world that can do that, that has been developed to do that, where the knowledge has been put together, the professionals have been assembled, the high level of strategy and the tactical level of execution has been examined to provide a master's degree in IP management. The master's degree is a recognized concept around the world. Certificates come, certificates go. People understand what master's degrees are. It's a particular credential that can help you in your current role or can perhaps open a new door for you. Along the way, you'll be exposed to class members around the world. You'll be exposed to faculty also from around the world. And you're gonna develop a network of contacts in the IP community that can help you find a job, that can help you get information for a client that you might have, that can help you just simply with problem solving in the area. The program here is designed in a way where the classes are interactive. So although you'll be online and you might be at home and you might be in your pajamas, you can be sitting with other students, interacting with other students, learning from other students about both the IP in their home and their perspectives on IP. And the same with the professors and the other professionals who are contributing to the online courses. All in all, what this means is as you head out and seek a career and pursue your career as an IP professional, you'll have a higher awareness of the important role of IP in the business world. There's a number of skills of jobs that are listed on this slide, all of which are touched on by IP skills. In some ways, however, I, there's nearly any professional level of employment, knowledge of IP will be necessary. We can pick a few of these out that are certainly quite obvious. If you're gonna be an IP licensing professional, having IP skills is important. Fine artists, writers, and painters, it's not quite so obvious, but ultimately it's how they make their money, isn't it? They produce these intellectual property works these things that should not be copied, and they make their money from it. 
we've had artists, writers, and pro painters in our live program here at IIT. They were looking to go maintain rights in a music portfolio or to acquire IP rights for art institutions. They were working with media. Could a television show use an image? Can a book quote a passage from another book? Again, another of the less obvious areas are financial managers and economists. But maybe it's not so inobvious now since we talked about our knowledge-based economy. Investment bankers, venture capitalists, they're looking at the, at the value of all of these companies, at every company. So many startup companies their entire value is premised upon the strength of the IP that they have. Without an understanding of the quality of IP, what quality IP is, what strong IP is, it is nearly impossible to assess the value of these startup companies, to assess the value of a portfolio of gathered works of art, of music, you all may understand that Michael Jackson, once upon a time, bought the Apple Records portfolio. Someone had to put a value on that. It was a very large number, and the, I don't recall offhand what that number was, in the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. But I took an understanding of what the rights were, how long they lasted, how long they could be exploded, exploited, and how they could be used. That was an economist, perhaps, that did that work. To gain entry to the program, it is a master's program, a graduate program. You do need an undergraduate degree from an accredited institution. We've had questions about uh, undergraduate degrees from different countries over the years. Generally, you'll find that if you've attended a recognized university, your degree will allow you to be entered into the program. We do look for two letters of recommendation. Those letters should talk about your quality as a student, your intelligence, your ability at problem solving. This sort of speaks to a, an interesting aspect here, which is IP professionals are diverse thinkers. You have to touch a number of areas to work in this area. Go back to the beginning, we talked about law, business, valuation, technology, innovation. Those are all aspects of intellectual property management. Any professional in the area has to have an ability to talk with lawyers, to talk with technologists, to talk with investment bankers, to talk with financial people and accountants, to talk to creative people in order to do this job well. Your essay as you apply for the program, might take some time to illustrate why you are that kind of person, why having that kind of job interests you, what is interesting to you about intellectual property. That's important for the program itself because we want students who can be helpful to their other classmates, who have a perspective and a unique perspective. Not everyone will get into the program, we're looking for people who can build a diverse class with a diverse set of interests to make the classes the most helpful and useful that they can be. The last on this list of application requirements is, is a pretty simple one, which is our classes are taught in English and you need to have a graduate level proficiency of English. In order to graduate, you're going to have to complete all of your courses in a five-year time period. That shouldn't be difficult. Um, they would require you to take a class or two a semester uh, over the time period. And you need to have a 3.0 on a 4.0 grade scale. Um, for those of you familiar with U.S. grading, that's a B average. Um, and it's necessary for graduation. The last few slides are, are informational. This particular slide, and you should be able to find this program, this slideshow on our website when this is finished. So you'll be able to use this email site, which can give you additional information on IPMM Global. 
a phone number to call, and some other references, uh, our website and the program measure, and some a FAQ and some other things. The last couple of slides are, are very interesting. If you're, if you're not sure still of what an IP professional does, there's a listing of blogs here. Um, there are thousands to be found. And these are some of the top ones that people look at. And finally, the last slide uh, that we have right now is the reading list. A bunch of books that you may expose yourself to, again, to expand your, your knowledge and your interest in IP management. With that, we've had a couple of questions that were submitted before the talk started, and we can address those, uh, I can address those now. A gentleman from Illinois has asked, uh, has been working in IP for three years, and he's interested in whether the program is best for someone who's been working, or if it's someone who's starting into the program. As I pointed out early on, we're looking at a high level and a dense accumulation of knowledge that's going to be available here. If for anyone who's joining the profession or who's been working in the profession for a number of years, there will be much to learn. There will be lots of knowledge that you can take home and make use of. Work experience is a benefit. It means you've probably been confronted with IP in your working life. That's not to say you shouldn't apply out of undergrad. Uh, that's an absolutely perfect thing to do, but work experience is great. Having experience in the profession is great. It adds to the diversity of the class, and there's no shortage of information that we can add to that which you've had in your work life. From New York, the question is about the online program and whether there are networking opportunities. Because the classes are semester-based, and they're developed to be interactive with your other classmates and with professors, there is an opportunity to develop connections across the world in the IP world. Your students and classmates will take jobs in a variety of areas after the program is over, and they'll expand your network and be able to help you understand uh, a variety of things in the world, whether it's local knowledge to them, whether it's business context that they might have. But there is significant opportunities to build a network of your own, even though the program is online. Our final question that we received before the program was from a paralegal who doesn't have a technical background. It's a very standard question. Can you do this without a technical background? The trademark from Apple is not technical, even though their computers and phones are. The program itself is oriented toward developing you a facility with technical subject matter. Simply, there's no way to know all of the technological information that you need to handle a broad array of IP work. In some instances, if you're in an investment banking firm, perhaps one day you're acquiring or selling a computer company and the next a pharmaceutical company. What makes technologists useful in that situation is their familiarity and their lack of fear of technology. In this program, we hope to build in you a lack of fear, to make you understand that you can get a strong enough background in a given technology to be useful in planning what the technology future in the IP uh, portfolio can be. Ultimately, you can draw on particular experts for particular questions just like we'll draw on a lawyer for a very technical law question, we might draw on a PhD chemist to ask a particular chemistry question. All of that together uh, means that you have to have the ability to talk to that lawyer and to talk to that professional technologist, but you don't have to be them. We hope to give you the knowledge and we will give you the knowledge in the program to allow you to deal with these people in the way that's most effective in the terms of IP. For right now, that's the end of our presentation. And we can uh, move on and look and see if maybe perhaps anyone submitted any questions while we were, while I was talking. There is one question, and I see that it says, uh, is the master's of program in IP management a law degree? It is not a law degree. If you take this program, you will not be allowed or prepared to sit for a bar exam. You need to go to law school for that. 
Um, it's a great degree to follow a law degree or to follow a law degree in a different country, uh, but it will not qualify you for the bar exam. You will learn a lot of law in the course of the program, you'll learn, but you'll learn a lot of other things that aren't available in law school, technology, business, and so forth. So uh, I don't see any other questions coming up. So with that, I'll say good night or farewell to wherever you happen to be. Thank you for attending the program. And if you have any questions, look up the slide that we have in the program and give us a call or send us an email. Thanks a lot. Good night.